so everyone in this line, please do not be overly electrical uh, or anything like that. And we got to make sure to keep it cool in here uh, today or everyone's going to fall asleep. So uh, if, if you start seeing me glistening up here, uh, as I am already, uh, thou, shalt, thou shalt not uh, set that uh, thermostat very high or we're going to... It's gonna be a it's gonna be a rough day. Uh, no two ways about it. No two ways about it. All right, let's uh, let's begin our uh, our time together. Ask the Lord to uh, to bless our day together. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity of gathering together. We have scheduled a very long day of teaching and instruction. We need your assistance and your help uh, to make this to be a profitable day. And so we would ask that you would be with us. That you would. Bless our conversations, uh, that you would uh, bless the word as it goes forth, increase our faith, help us to understand, make us to be better servants of yours. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. In Psalm 12, we read these words. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth refined seven times. O, you, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. It is very, very common uh, for Psalm 12, 6, and 7 to be uh, taken as a text referring to the preservation of the text of Scripture itself. And uh, very often I have been told that when I speak on the subject and if I talk about uh, any type of variation, if I uh, just simply admit the existence of certain manuscripts and what those manuscripts say, uh, things along those lines, uh, that somehow I am questioning uh, the validity of this particular text and the promises that it allegedly contains. And uh, certainly the King James Only movement uh, often utilizes the King James rendering of this particular text as evidence uh, along these lines. Uh, this is an example of where we need to be very careful in how we handle the text of Scripture. Um, in reality, when you look at what is said in its context, um, the promise is, because the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says Yahweh, I will set him in the safety for which he longs. So a promise has been given by God uh, to... Um, assist the needy and the afflicted. And it is that promise that is in view in verse 6. The words of the Lord in that promise are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them, that is the needy. You will preserve him, that is the destitute, from this generation forever. And so while it is a, it's a, it's a wonderfully uh, proper thing to be looking at texts, I think in Isaiah 40 and other places we have texts that talk about the preservation of Scripture, we need to be very, very careful that there is, a, there is what I would call pious eisegesis. Pious eisegesis. Um, exegesis is when you read out of a text the meaning that is inherent in the words and the intention of the author, what do you want to communicate to his audience? Eisegesis is when you take something that you want to see in the text and you read it into the text. And that is an abuse of anyone's words. Uh, it's um, if someone treated your emails, your blog posts, your instructions to your teenage uh, children um, uh, eisegetically, uh, you would not feel uh, respected uh, were that to happen. When your kids, um, as teenagers, and of course I am now a grandfather, so I can, I can now start telling all the stories about my, about my kids, and, and it's okay now. Uh, you're allowed to do that once you get past a certain age. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you give them instructions as to what they need to do that day. Um, it, it's amazing the facility of the human mind to engage in eisegesis. Uh, the incorrect interpretation of the intention of what the parent intended to communicate to that teenage child, uh, and yet for some reason they want to hear other than what the parent is actually saying, especially with my son when it came to that front lawn, uh, that, that mowing thing. Uh, we actually had grass for a little while in our front lawn, 
Uh, in Arizona, that's not a wise thing. Um, we put just enough water on it to, to torture it into some semblance of life, um, which means when you mowed it, it was just this big dust cloud with a few little pieces of, of, of grass in it. But uh, it was just amazing how he could eisegete my words as to what I needed him to do in regards to the lawn, and then we would go do fun stuff, and that's the, 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 the bad stuff just disappeared. Well, it happens when it comes to theology as well, sometimes good theology. There's everything good in believing that God is going to keep his words. It's just you need to make sure that when you find uh, a text that uh, you think is saying that, that that's actually what the psalmist was attempting to communicate. Uh, when you actually read Psalm 12 in, in, in its context, you realize that uh, verse 8 is just sort of hanging out there in the wind if verses 6 and 7 are what very often they are said to be. Uh, verse 8, by the way, is one of my, uh, I think, one of the most relevant texts to what we see in our society around us today, by the way. Uh, the wicked strut about on every side when that which is vile is exalted among the sons of men. Uh, we're seeing that all the time. Uh, we see the fulfillment of Romans 1, those who practice wickedness encourage others in the in the practicing of that wickedness. And that makes perfect sense in the context. The, the needy are being afflicted by the evil. Earlier on in, in, in Psalm 12, the, 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 the evil say, who is Lord over us? Who is Lord over us? We control our own tongues. We, this is, I mean, this is an amazing description of what we're seeing today, actually. And so it, the context flows perfectly um, when you don't insert something in there that the psalmist actually wasn't talking about. And so I just start with this just as a reminder to us that when we, uh, when we finished last night, I sort of gave you what I think is the most important aspect of uh, the issue of the text of the New Testament in particular. And that is, I want to know what John, I want to know what Paul, I want to know what Luke, I want to know what Peter, or if we were, if we're really honest with ourselves, what Peter's amanuensis, he names one by name, uh, he was dictating his letter to someone. And you ever thought about that? Because, uh, for example, one of the arguments that Bart Ehrman makes uh, against Second Peter being having anything to do with Peter at all is based upon style. And there is no question about the fact that if you read First Peter and Second Peter in the original language, there's a tremendous difference between the two. Um, uh, second Peter is uh, participial, or is it First Peter? One of the two we called participial Peter. I'd have to look back at which one, which one was which, but uh, we called him participial Peter because there was just, there, if you wanted to study the syntax of participles, this was the book to go to because there's just participles everywhere. Well, the other one doesn't have nearly as many participles. And so, just simply on a linguistic basis, it's really easy to go, uh, you're looking at different styles here. What's, what's the difference? And the answer is fairly easy at hand, uh, and, and that is, uh, if Peter is dictating this epistle, and he dictates it to two different people, and what if he's, and this is, this is something you gotta think about, uh, what's Peter's natural mother tongue? Um, is he able to communicate in Greek? Probably. Um, but is that, is that his mother tongue? No, it wouldn't have been, not, not as a fisherman in Galilee. It would have been a form of Aramaic. So is it possible that Peter uh, dictates his, uh, his letters in Aramaic, but since they're going to be going to Greek-speaking churches, uh, he's trusting his amanuensis to translate that? Where is the locus of inspiration at that point? Because remember, if we think that the writer is the one, and there's a, there's a deep-seated idea in our mind that, and, and we'll even use the term, even I'll use the term, even though I know the inaccuracy of it, I'll use the term, well, Paul was inspired to say. Well, it's not Paul that was inspired. That's that Paul himself said, all scripture is theonoustos. We, even, we, don't, we don't even think accurately about the word inspired. That's actually not a really good word. Inspire is a Latin phrase to mean to breathe into. And so we can talk about uh, uh, certain plays that just seem to be inspired. That is, there is a breathing into the, the words of something special. That, that's, that's not what scripture's talking about. 
What we're talking about is when God gives us scripture, when God gives to his people that scripture, that is God speaking. That's what Jesus held men accountable to. That's what Paul held men accountable to, etc., etc. So where does that take place? What's the process there? Well, we don't have a description other than those key texts. Peter says men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But have you ever noticed that there's a textual variant there too? There is. There's an important one. In fact, let's just go ahead and let's take a look at that because I, I, want, I want to point this out. I discussed this once with um, Dan Wallace on, on the, uh, the program. Um, do, do, I'm just being very careful that I, I uh, don't want to knock this thing uh, right off the... the if, I, if I put it down on the uh, uh, pulpit, uh, all of a sudden everything will go blank. Um, here is uh, New American Standard for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God but if we look at uh, the King James at that point you'll see that there is a difference first of all the font is much much smaller <laughs> that's the biggest difference for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Do you see what the difference is? In the King James, it says holy men, whereas in the New American Standard, it keeps shrinking back down to some tiny size, it says, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And the difference uh, between those is found in the underlying text, the underlying Greek text, where in what's called the, I'm going to add, go ahead and add it in here so we can see it. Uh, Texas Receptus is good enough. Right there. Uh, hoi hagioi theu anthropoi, the holy men of God. And that phrase, uh, holy, holy ones, is, is describing men, uh, whereas here in the modern text, uh, well, modern text, in the modern eclectic text, but by the Holy Spirit, by being carried along, spoke from God men. So the descriptor holy is repeated twice in the Textus Receptus, but it's not in uh, the text that underlies New American Standard, uh, NIV, so on and so forth. I think this is an important, very, very important variant. Um, it's important for a lot of reasons, uh, but for one's uh, doctrine of inspiration especially. Little reminder there that we all should uh, silence our phones. I had not silenced mine, uh, so mine could have been going off at any moment. So I think I will do that right there. And little trick, little trick. If you put your iPhone face down, Siri will not interrupt you all the time. Because I don't know why it is, but there are a number of, I mean, Siri is not a real, really common, you know, word or phrase, but uh, my phone just kept going, what can I help you with? And even during a sermon once, that was really bad. Um, and then someone said, well, if you put it face down, Siri won't listen to you anymore. And it's like, oh, well, cool. I didn't know that. So if you put your iPhone face down, Siri will ignore you, which is, uh, which is good. Anyway, how do we, where, what were we talking about here? Yes, we were talking about 2 Peter 1.21. It's important uh, to me especially because of the fact that in dealing with Islam, one of the fundamental differences between our view of inspiration and that of Islam um, is we focus inspiration on the act of God. They focus it upon the prophets. So the pro there are many Muslims who believe the prophets were sinless. And one of the things, they are absolutely scared scandalized by the fact that the Bible, for example, talks about the sins of the prophets. Uh, David, Bathsheba, that's disgusting. That, that, that's, that's horrible. That, that, that proves the Bible's not the Word of God. 
uh, how, 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 how dare you blaspheme a prophet that way? Noah? Drunkenness? No, impossible. That, that proves the Bible is just, is just a perverted book, and, I, and that's exactly what they've said. Uh, so what you have is a book that's, their book is written 600 years after the New Testament, but it's expurgated, it's, it's cleaned up everything based upon this idea that the real authority of Scripture comes from the people who wrote it, because that goes back to Muhammad's claims about himself. That was never the understanding. The understanding of, of certainly of the Old Testament prophets, you have, you have Isaiah, in whom we find no, no guilt as far as, you know, you don't have what you have with Noah or David or Solomon or anybody like that. And yet, when he stands before God's throne in Isaiah chapter 6, what does he say? Woe to me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I live amongst a people of unclean lips. There is the understanding of the sinfulness of mankind. And therefore, the authority of Scripture is never connected to the moral character of the individual through whom it comes. And so you can have Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, giving us Daniel chapter 4, talking about God's sovereignty and his kingship over the nations, and there's nothing weird about that. God can reveal himself as he sees fit. He can use a donkey if he wants to. That's perfectly fine. But that's not the case in the mindset of, uh, of Islam. And interestingly enough, uh, there is always this tendency, even amongst Christians, for the development of some kind of a idea um, of a, a holy priest class um, that ends up elevating the apostles and the prophets to a level that the scripture does, never, never actually assigns to them. And so uh, there is the, the, the variant there uh, at 2 Peter 1.21. It is interesting to note uh, that the later text uh, has uh, the holy men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, whereas the earlier text uh, has the very last word is men. Uh, every, it, when you really look at the, at the it's, it's, but by the, S the Holy Spirit being carried along, spoke from God, men. Uh, there's no emphasis, there's no focus upon uh, the man because what's the assertion being made? Prophecy, revelation, never had its origin in the Thelemati, the will of man. And of course, the vast majority of theories regarding Scripture today, that's where they place the whole concept of where Scripture comes from. Is, you know, Paul just got up one morning and decided uh, you know, he had been doing some serious thinking about uh, salvation, and so he writes this amazing book to the Romans. And um, uh, that's where we get Romans, is you know, it came forth from the will of, of man. Uh, well, Paul certainly wanted to write to the Church of Rome about the doctrine of salvation. There's no question about that. Uh, but the idea that uh, he was the one who originates that gospel, originates all these things, there's this, there is a, 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 tremendous, uh, a tremendously high doctrine of inspiration when you can recognize that what, how Paul speaks is different than how Peter speaks. We don't, some Christians do have, and I, I don't want to offend anybody, but some Christians do have the idea that inspiration takes place like automatic writing. Uh, like, you know, Paul's just sitting there and then all of a sudden he goes into this fit and immediately people are scrambling for pieces of papyri uh, so they can start writing down uh, this revelation. You know, his, you know, he starts frothing at the mouth, and uh, I, Paul, Apostle, and oh, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes Revelation. And that's sort of what happened with Muhammad. Uh, that really is the description of, of, of Muhammad going into these, these fits um, of Revelation, and uh, then would, would dictate to his followers what had just been revealed to him by the angel Jibreel. Uh, but none of it had anything to do with Muhammad. Uh, well, that's, that's not what we believe happened. Uh, Paul has a certain style. When Paul says to, the, says to Timothy, bring the, the cloak and the, uh, and the parchments, uh, you know, the Muslims look at that and go, well, that, that can't be scripture. That's, that's just Paul speaking. Yeah, it is Paul speaking. 
men spoke from God as they are carried along by the Holy Spirit. It is, it is how God has chosen to make his revelation to us, and uh, that is what we have uh, to, to this very day. So uh, just some thoughts to get, our, get, get your mind starting to function this morning. Uh, I know it's going to be difficult to uh, focus in on a few things. Now, I mentioned this uh, to you last night. And I want to go back to it as we start uh, this part of the presentation. I mentioned to you, uh, started talking to you a little bit about papyrus and P45. I'm going to show you more papyrus in the future. Um, but this is, this is a particularly important one. I mentioned to you that it contained Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. That was very unusual about that. What makes this a particularly important papyrus is not that it's the earliest, because it's, it's not. Um, it's fairly early, but it's, it's in fact, it's, it's really the earliest papyrus um, witness we have for the Gospel of Mark. Isn't it interesting that the theory today, if you're not aware of this, the, the, the predominant theory amongst New Testament scholars today is that Mark was the first Gospel, and then uh, Matthew and Luke used Mark and edited him, and then John was way down the road someplace. Now, I don't happen to be in the majority on this particular perspective. I don't necessarily buy into that. I don't know that we can determine any type of literary uh, relationship uh, between uh, the Gospels in that way. Uh, I think it raises more questions than it actually ends up answering. And I think the Gospel is a lot earlier than most of the theories uh, uh, out there present them to be. But be that as it may, it is interesting that the, the most widely documented uh, Gospel in the papyri is John, uh, not Mark. Mark is the least represented. Uh, if the papyri tell us anything, then Mark was the least popular of, of the Gospels, not the most popular of the Gospels, which is interesting. Um, this is a section from John. This is actually John chapter 10. Uh, Jesus and uh, the, as the good shepherd laying down his life for the sheep. What's interesting about P45, what's fascinating actually to, for a few of us, about, I don't know, half a dozen of us around the world, um, about P45 is that it's very clear that the scribe had access to multiple copies of the books that he was drawing from that came from different families of texts. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, as we will see, as I'll show you some, some graphics later on, uh, scholars divide the New Testament text up into different families. Generally, uh, when you, you develop a list of, of variants, and when a manuscript agree, agrees 70 to 75 percent of the time with one particular family in this list of variants, then it's placed into that family. Um, and so you have on the one side what's called the Alexandrian manuscripts. And generally, these are, these are places, Alexandria in Egypt, uh, the Byzantine manuscripts, Byzantium, Constantinople, Istanbul, as we call it today. Uh, you have Western manuscripts, which are basically related to the Latin Vulgate, and they come from Italy and places in, the, in that, that part of, of Europe. Um, these major divisions are connected to place names, but we don't really know that, they, that, that originally it was just simply, well, this was the text in this area, this was the text in that area. Um, certain texts did become popular. We are going to look at a little bit of church history. We have to because the, the text in the New Testament came to us through history. Uh, so often uh, theories are developed about how these came to us. I've seen one theory where this guy just does all this calculus and all the, you know, all these really complex mathematical formula. And I'm just sitting here looking at it and I said, that, that's, that's, that's brilliant. There's only one little problem. Uh, these texts came down to us through history. And history's messy. History doesn't follow calculus. Uh, weird things happen in history. I mean, uh, I've got a picture, a really fascinating picture, of um, a pew in, um, uh, in a church in Wandsworth, London, um, uh, Trinity Road Chapel in Wandsworth. And in one of the pews, there's this indentation, just this perfect indentation of some kind of an object. And it is an incendiary bomb dropped by the Germans. They would drop these little incendiary bombs and they'd be on different timers and so they'd, they'd start fires at different places so the fire brigades couldn't put all the fires out. It was meant to create maximum damage. And, and during World War II, uh, when London was being bombed, one of these had gone through the roof of this church and right onto this pew. 
And thankfully some guy riding by on a bike had seen it happen and ran into the church and got it out before it exploded, but there was this indentation right there on the pew. Now what does this have to do with manuscripts? So what, what if that particular uh, building uh, had housed a particular manuscript? and the guy hadn't seen that happen. Well, that manuscript would have been destroyed by what? By the absolute wild vagaries of war. And that's what happened in history. Things happened in history. There's, there's this thing called Islam <laughs> uh, that, that sweeps across North Africa. That's going to impact the number of manuscripts being produced, okay? And um, the Western half of Europe changed languages, changed common language from Greek to what? To Latin. And that's going to impact the number of Greek manuscripts versus Latin manuscripts that are taking place. And, and uh, for, for up, at, up until the middle of the 15th century, you continue to have Greek being the primary language being spoken around Byzantium. And so they're still producing Greek manuscripts around that time period a lot longer than anybody else's. This is all history. This is going to impact the number of manuscripts you have and the kinds of manuscripts. You cannot run a computer simulation. To, to figure out when a bomb is going to go through the roof of a, of a particular place that has a particular manuscript in it. There were a lot of manuscripts, even Quranic manuscripts, interesting enough, that were, that were destroyed in World War II. Uh, the Germans had been working on Quranic textual uh, studies for a long time, and Germany got bombed horrifically uh, in, in the last few years of the war, and there were things that were lost. There were manuscripts that were destroyed. That's happened in every century. I mean, Europe, <laughs> 20th century was not a really good year. Uh, not a good year, century uh, in, in Europe as far as that type of thing went. Millions and millions of people killed. All sorts of stuff happened. And that's happened every century. You simply can't run computer simulations and, and come up with a meaningful response. And yet, uh, people do that type of stuff. We have to remember that this book came to us through history. And unfortunately, a lot of us don't know a lot about that history to begin with. And uh, the result is, well, the result that we have. P45, then, uh, is important, and I, I, I have a little blow-up. Uh, this, is, this is a section about the sheep uh, and uh, uh, giving my life to the sheep, and, and the Father loves me because, uh, because I give my life to the sheep and things like that. Here is, a, here is someone, was he a Christian or non-Christian? Don't know. Why would a non-Christian be copying something like this if someone paid him to? Well, wasn't it, wasn't it illegal up until 313 A.D. Uh, to even possess the Christian scriptures? Yep, there was persecution starting from Nero all the way until 313. But it waxed and waned, and it would be worse in one area. There might be really bad persecution in Lyon and nothing going on in Greece. Uh, it all depended on the Roman procurators and politics and all sorts of stuff like that. It wasn't until about 250, 260, that it became empire-wide and, and, the, and the emperor was pushing, 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 and that's when the worst persecution took place, those last 50, 60 years, before the peace of the church in AD 313 under Constantine. And so uh, there were periods of time when you could have paid a professional scribe to, to make a copy of the scriptures. So there were, uh, we, do, do we know anything about this, this scribe? We can, we can guess by some of his, some of the ways that he did things, uh, some things about him, but no, there's no names. It wasn't, this was copied by so-and-so on such-and-such a date. That'd be wonderful. That'd be nice. That, that doesn't happen, uh, especially since this was a, originally a book that had 220 pages, and now it has uh, far fewer than that, and so a lot of stuff has been, has been lost. Uh, but uh, what, what sources did he draw from? Well, if he, if he wasn't a Christian, and he was provided with sources. This tells us a little something about what Christians had. And what we can tell is, at this point in time, you had the different textual families, at least the Alexandrian and the Western, you had, you had the earliest representatives of them already in existence, and, and maybe even a few early Byzantine readings, and he had to choose between them. So, so here was a scribe, and guess what? If you're a scribe and you have more than one manuscript in front of you, what do you absolutely of necessity have to engage in? You've got to engage in textual criticism. You've got to, if you have, if you have two copies in front of you and they differ on a word, you're going to have to make a decision as to which one you're going to do. Or, what else, what's, what's the third opportunity? You could conflate the readings. In other words, if you have two words and you don't want to lose either one, you could put both of them into your copy. 
And we do have incidents, incidents where that happens. Now obviously if you see a completed reading, that it's generally indicated this is a later manuscript. It's someone who's looking at two other ones and putting them together and so this is not the original reading, but uh, that did happen. But the point is, at every single step along the way, from the very beginning, there was involvement in looking at the manuscripts. We have early church fathers that talked about the variations that existed in the manuscripts in their day, all the way back into the second century. So there's nothing new about this. This is the, this is the reality of the transmission of the text. And the reality really is that the presence of textual variation is a good thing, not a bad thing. Now, why is that? Well, that's what you need to understand, so let's, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Few today understand the history of ancient documents, let's be honest. Uh, that's not covered in most of our educational backgrounds. Uh, the process of transmission in antiquity is vastly different than today, which is, is uh, hopefully a, a, a given. Um, we produce text very differently today than we did in the past. Hand copying was the only way to produce documents for distribution until relatively recent times. We talked a little bit about even how once you uh, invent printing in the West, the Chinese had it long before we did, but uh, once you invent printing in the West, you still have to typeset it. There's still the, the, the problem of, of human error involved in that process. Uh, it, it's, it's still just simply the way things are. Every document produced prior to printing and even after printing has been corrupted in its transmission. Now corruption is a technical term. Unfortunately, it is very frequently used in an emotional way rather than a technical way. Because you see, corrupted simply means uh, any disturbance any uh, error in the transmission of a text, in, uh, no matter how minor it might be. So if, um, you know, I mentioned last evening if I, uh, if I started off a um, couple paragraphs on a piece of paper in the front row, had it copied to the next row, to the next row, all the way back to the back, that by the time we got back to the back, uh, there would be corruption in the text for various reasons. Uh, it could be something really simple, like you forgot your reading glasses, okay? You know, I'm, I'm past 50 now, and uh, so uh, I can sort of uh, do this a little bit, but for really doing copying, it would be, it'd be pretty rough if I didn't have my, my wonderful progressive lenses uh, to be able to see what in the world uh, I'm doing. Uh, now, some of you younger folks, you're just sitting there going, ha, 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 trust me, it's coming. And it's coming a lot faster than you actually uh, believe that it will be. Um, but, but you could also have the fact that I've, I've always noticed that the lighting in here is so uneven. It's so uneven, isn't it? You've got the black hole right here, okay? The, the black hole of lighting right here. And so if I were sitting in the black hole of lighting, I, it would be next to impossible for me to read almost anything. So if you happen to be where Van is, where the, it's the, the I have the angelic glow on my head spot, uh, where it's almost like, man, could you turn it down a little bit? I mean, yikes. Um, uh, you're going to have plenty of light to be able to see and be able to maybe make a good copy. So it, it, interestingly enough, it, it might have something to do with lighting. Think about how tough it was. I mean, all the way through the handwritten period of the, of the New Testament, you didn't have sunglasses, uh, sunglasses. Well, you didn't have sunglasses either. You didn't have glasses. Uh, you didn't have uh, lights at night. You had a, ca a flickering candle. Um, uh, Erasmus, when he would be working on his manuscripts, even in the, in the 16th century, would complain uh, about being uh, eaten by fleas, which he believed were demons. Uh, and, and so, I, I mean, you've got all sorts of things that would be uh, that would be distracting you. And you didn't have real nice pens and stuff like that. You had quills and, and, and ink that would, you know, we have manuscripts where the, the, uh, the scribe did make a note uh, that he was late getting the manuscript done because it was so cold his ink kept freezing. Okay, you, it's, gonna, it's just gonna impact the accuracy of your work when you're, when you're freezing so, uh, you know, it's freezing cold and things like that. So there's all sorts of, of things that could impact 
uh, that, kind, uh, that kind of a process. And so the technical term we use for the existence of any uh, variation of text is corruption. But you can see that that term has a really super negative connotation because just attach it to the word political. <laughs> and it's automatic, oh, you mean pretty much all politicians? Yes, okay, so that means money under the table and, and uh, doing what's good for you but not good for the country. And, and, and so automatically the word brings all this really nasty negative stuff along with it. Um, and so when you hear about the text being corrupted, it normally communicates the idea corrupted and there's no way of knowing what the original was. That's, that's not the technical meaning. It just simply means that any type of process, if, if there's any point, any point in time where there has to be decisions made between variant readings, then that is referred to as corruption. It's, it has not been a perfect transmission. And nothing could have been transmitted perfectly except in one way. And that is if you chiseled something on a rock on a hillside someplace. Now that doesn't really work overly well for the distribution of tracts, <laughs> scriptures, and things like that. Uh, if you want to know what it said, uh, we can't make copies of it, but you can travel to such and such a country and climb a high mountain and read it for yourself. That's, uh, that's the best that we can do. And, uh, okay, who breathed? <laughs> who breathed? Uh, did, by the way, did the donuts arrive? The donuts arrived. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that I'm walking back to... Um, uh, to actually get this to, uh, to reconnect, and then I'm going to make a bolt uh, so that no one can beat me to the, uh, the cream-filled donut. Um, uh, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. So how long did that last? That lasted, that lasted a fairly long time. I just, I just don't see what... 36 minutes! Oh, I see. Okay, there we go. I just, uh, I don't know what, uh, it's, it's just sort of like it just gets tired of doing it and says, I'm tired of talking to that thing. Okay, so I'm going to stop. All right, so, so when we use the term corruption, that's what we're talking about. Uh, it, it, it is not a statement that we can no longer determine what the original is. There are different levels of corruption. Look, we, there are works of antiquity that are thoroughly corrupted to the point where we, we really don't know what the original was for vast sections of it because we only have one or two manuscripts, they're extremely fragmentary. Uh, yeah, and in fact, there, there, there are lots of works of antiquity where you will have bracket, then a huge hole. And we don't know what was there. We don't know what was there. Remember when the Gospel of Judas came out? There was, we only had little fragments of it because we only have one manuscript and who knows what was here, there, everywhere. It's all speculation, things like that. That's never the case with the New Testament uh, in any way. So corruption equals any variation or alteration, no matter how minor. Uh, the replication of a letter, spelling differences, they, they, all, they all count. There are over 5,700 catalog Greek manuscripts. Last I, the last number I saw was 5717. Why would the number change so often? Um, because there's continued work being done, and especially because of what's called the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, Dan Wallace and the guys down in Dallas. They're going around uh, doing high-resolution uh, uh, high digital photography, trying to get, because we've, for example, we've already lost manuscripts in, um, in Iraq. There were biblical manuscripts in Iraq that ISIS has destroyed. They're gone. And all we have is microfilm or something like that, uh, if, if we had anything of them at all. So it happens. Fires happen, bombings happen, still a violent world. And so they're going around and trying to digitize uh, all of the Greek manuscripts uh, to make sure that we have all of them. And so what happens is they'll be, they'll be digitizing one and all of a sudden realize that actually what we're digitizing here is the other half of a manuscript we digitized before. And we thought there were two different manuscripts, now they're actually one. So the number goes down. Or they'll be paging through and go, hey, this is actually two different manuscripts that have been bound together. Now the number goes up one. Uh, so that, that's sort of uh, why the number varies uh, from time to time. But 5717 is the last number that I, that I saw. So um, uh, comprising ancient papyri containing only, only a few lines of text to complete manuscripts from the 15th century. So that 5700 number, little fragments this big, 
entire uh, New Testaments from Matthew to Revelation from the year 1500. Now, which one is more important textually? A fragment from John from 100 years after it was written or an entire New Testament that's a copy of 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 a copy from a millennium and a half after the birth of Christ. Obviously, and it's not, it's not just a, a simplistic way of saying it, but obviously the earlier the manuscript is, generally, the more valuable it is as far as its witness to the text. I mean, if we had a big old room here and it extended back uh, for, for 300 rows and we did the copying test, um, which manuscripts are going to have the most likelihood of containing the originals? The one from the first 10 rows or the one from the last 20 rows way back at the back of the, of, of the room? It's pretty obvious which one's which. And so uh, that's one of the things that has to be kept in mind. Including ancient translations such as Latin, uh, Coptic, Boharic, Syriac. There were a lot of early translations done in the first couple hundred years. More than 24,000 manuscripts uh, are known in regards to the New Testament itself. No ancient work comes close to the New Testament with reference to the number of witnesses and the number of early witnesses. And I need to look here real quick. I didn't include this, so we're not going to we're not going to uh, mess with it right now. But I. Uh, I have a really cool uh, video clip from my debate with Bart Ehrman. And it was one of those situations where I didn't expect this to happen, but it, it you know, Lord in his providence. Uh, I asked Bart Ehrman, uh, he had said on the Unbelievable Radio broadcast uh, that there is an enormous time period between when Paul wrote the book of Galatians and our first copy, which is 150 years. He calls that an enormous time period. So I said, what would you call the time period between the earliest manuscripts we have of Suetonius or Pliny or Tacitus, which were contemporaries with the New Testament and their first manuscript copies? And he said, ginormous. Uh, ginormous doesn't cover it. And then, without any prompting from me, he said, we have much earlier attestation of the New Testament than for any other work of antiquity. Now, he's the leading critic of the New Testament in the English-speaking world. And he straightforward said, for the New Testament, we have much earlier attestation than for, for any other work of antiquity. And he's exactly right. That is a factual reality. While the average time period between when books contemporaneous with the New Testament were written and their first copies is between 500 and 900 years, for the New Testament, we have fragments within 100 years. So you're talking one-fifth to one-ninth uh, the time frame for the New Testament you have for the vast majority of the books of antiquity. Which means if you're going to be skeptical about the New Testament, then you should be hyper-skeptical, massively skeptical about all of the works of antiquity. But of course, the vast majority of our friends aren't that way. Uh, they'll quote Tacitus and Pliny and won't even, won't even give it a second thought. But when it comes to the New Testament, well, all of a sudden, uh, you have a, a double standard being applied at that particular point in time. Now think about this, then we'll take a break. If we only have one manuscript of the Gospel of Matthew, how many textual variants will that manuscript contain? None. Because you have nothing to compare it to. And so, when people start getting anxious about how many textual variants there are in the New Testament, what they need to realize is if, if you don't like those notes at the bottom of your page, you've got a couple choices. Uh, one choice is you become a Muslim because they don't have notes at the bottom of the page. <laughs> uh, well, I'll take that back. There, there is a new, uh, there's a new publication called the Study Quran. If I, people keep asking me, you know, what Quran should I buy and stuff like that. Uh, whatever else you do, you, you need to have the study Quran in your library. Um, it's, it's the best uh, collection of Islamic scholarship I've ever seen. And it's as close as they've ever gotten to the ESV study Bible. <laughs> if, if, if you, how many of you have an ESV study Bible? Anybody have one here? Okay, anybody have one with you? 
Okay, look at the size of that thing. I mean, the, 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 you, can, you can kill somebody with that. Uh, the Reformation Study Bible is even worse. Anybody have a Reformation Study Bible? Got it with you? Look at, look at the size of that thing. You can stop a bullet with that, okay? Um, so these things, you know, and, and, in, and many times you'll have this much text and that much notes on a page. The, the, the study Quran, this is the first time their, their page is like that. You have this much of the Quran, that, that much study notes beneath it. Um, they will note some variations in the Mus'haf, the, the, uh, the manuscripts of the, of the Quran. Um, but the vast majority of, of Qurans, there's, there's no notes at the bottom that say some manuscripts say this, some manuscripts say that, 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 you know. So if you don't like, if you don't like that kind of thing, you can, you can go the Muslim route where you just simply ignore that they exist, I suppose. Um, but the, uh, the thing that you need to understand is people who frequently quote Psalm 12 don't like those, those notes, which by the way, there were hundreds of those notes in the original King James. The original King James not only had uh, textual notes, it also had translation notes, or it could be rendered this, or it could be rendered that. Almost no modern King James printings include those. I wish they did, because it would be extremely detrimental to King James onlyism. Uh, but the, most of the King James that are, translate, uh, that are published today don't have that material uh, in them any longer. You have to dig around in the older, older versions to find that. Um, but if you don't like those notes, what you're really doing is saying, I want to have a text where I don't know what its history was. So if you have only one manuscript of Matthew, you're going to have no textual variance. But if you only have one manuscript of Matthew, what do you have to trust? That that particular scribe got it exactly right and made no mistakes. Because if he didn't, and you only have one manuscript, if he made a mistake, if he, if he skipped something, it's gone. It's gone. There's no way of recovering it if you only have one manuscript. Remember last night we looked at 1 John 3, 1. And the phrase, and we are. It's a statement that we are the children of God. And it's not in the majority of Greek manuscripts. But we're very, very confident that it's the original reading because we have more than one manuscript of 1 John. And so the more manuscripts you have, the more variants you're going to have because any difference is counted as a variant, no matter how minor or small it might be. But what would you rather have? 100 manuscripts of 1 John from a wide distribution of places and a wide distribution of times, not all from the same person. 100 manuscripts of 1 John or only one manuscript of 1 John? Well, obviously you want to have 100 because then you can compare them. But what happens when you have 100 manuscripts of 1 John? You're going to get textual variation. But that textual variation does not in any way overthrow the fact that the more manuscripts you have, the greater confidence you have that you still possess what? The original readings. The original readings are still there. That's the important thing to keep in mind. And most people just don't think this way. They haven't been taught. They haven't had it explained to them. Yeah, it's a whole lot better to have 100 manuscripts. You have to work through the textual variants that are a result, but the confidence you have that the original message and words of 1 John are still there is far greater if you have 100 than if you only have one. Unfortunately, I think if you were to take a survey of most people, they'd rather have the one. Simplify it. But what are you sacrificing to simplify it? The truth. <laughs> the, the truth of what, what was actually written. Uh, yeah, but I'd just rather be comfortable with my traditions. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a shame. If you only have one witness, you'll have no textual variance, but you'll likewise have little basis on which to believe you have the original text. The more witnesses you have, the confidence you have that you possess the original text increases. It increases exponentially. And so the real problem that we have and I'll, I'll go ahead and use this description, then we'll take a break. Um, guy's name keeps slipping my mind. I, I can see his face, but his name keeps slipping my mind. One fellow once used a, a really, really good analogy in a podcast I was listening to. What we have with the New Testament is like having a 10,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. 10,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. Anybody ever done a 10,000-piece jigsaw puzzle? That's a big one. That's a, how about a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle? Anybody done a thousand piece? Now we're getting down into, yeah, okay, all right, that's, that's a, little bit, a little bit easier to do. 
thousand, uh, we'll go ahead with a, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, okay? With what we have in the New Testament, because of the nature of how scribes copied, now scribes could lose things. Homo teleton, you can lose things. But the general tendency is expansion, not losing something. What do I mean? Well, I'll use the illustration, when, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example when, when, we, when we come back, but the idea is this. What we have in the New Testament is not 990 pieces. That would be, that'd be a tragedy. We'd be missing something. What we have in the New Testament is we have 1,100 pieces. We have 1,100 pieces to a 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. So textual criticism is a process whereby we filter out the added 100. But the point is we have all the 1,000 original pieces. And that's key. Because all the criticisms of the New Testament, what are they based upon the assumption of? We've lost the original readings. We don't know what John originally meant to in, uh, communicate and so on and so forth. These doctrines have been taken out. Things, no. We can have confidence that we have all the original words of the apostles. We can absolutely, and the only way to have that as a firm confidence is to realize there's textual variation and to realize the process whereby we can recover those things, not dig them out from some place that's never been heard of before, but we can have absolute confidence that this is the mechanism God used to protect the text. Because what's the real allegation that's used? Well, doctrines have been put in, doctrines have been taken out. Wholesale editing. What's the greatest evidence there can be no wholesale ed editing? the fact that we have so many manuscripts that were immediately distributed all over the world. And so I'm going to show you the difference between what's called free transmission of the text, which is what we have in the New Testament, and a controlled transmission of the text, which is what you have with the Quran. When we come back and uh, after we discover uh, the joys and the, uh, the glories of our donuts. So we're going to take a... We're going to take a break, and it's good, however long it takes me to find the donuts. So how's that, how's that for defining the amount of time? So let's take a break, and we'll be right back.